You are looking at a live image over Gaza at this hour as we do get to the latest here out of the Middle East. Israel's defense chiefs saying they accept full responsibility for the accidental killings of three hostages who were attempting to escape captivity in Gaza. Initial reports indicate those three hostages were waving a white flag when they were fatally shot by Israeli troops. The IDF saying the actions were against the Army's rules of engagement and were being investigated at the highest level. In the meantime, Israel's prime minister says the fighting will continue until the end with the goal of eliminating Hamas. And U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is going to visit Israel this week as Washington has expressed concerns over civilian casualties in Gaza. As always on Sunday mornings here, I do want to get to the latest and break all of this down. So let's bring in Mark Chandler, the director of government relations at Coastal Carolina University and a professor of practice, also a former senior intelligence defense official, joining us now live. As always, Mark, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us and provide a little bit more context on everything that is going on. We appreciate it. Good morning, Josh, and you're quite welcome. Hopefully we can break this down for the viewers. I sure hope so. Well, first off, can you kind of break down your thoughts on Netanyahu's comments? He did hold a news conference yesterday. We heard some uh, from some other senior officials as well. Just kind of break down uh, your thoughts there on those comments and what stood out to you. Well, Josh, I, I think first off, Netanyahu was in a tough position, especially after that friendly fire incident that uh, ended in the result of three dead hostages. So he was in a, in a difficult situation going in. However, I think he showed resolve and tried to strike a balance, one, to reiterate the importance of the hostages and their safe return, which he did say that they need to do that. Secondly, though, he did reiterate the fact that they have to contain, defeat, destroy Hamas, and that is still their primary military objective. And I think leading through that, he talked about how the strength of the military actions helped drive to the negotiations. So I think that's going to help him a lot. And we talked about the Israeli troops mistakenly shooting and killing those three hostages that were held by Hamas. And the military says that those men were shirtless, waving a white flag. Can you explain for me how something like this might have happened? I know, as we mentioned, it's going to be investigated. Well, first and foremost, this is a tragedy, and my thoughts go out to those those families of those hostages, especially following the fact that they were held, you know, they were taken by the Hamas terrorists on October 7th, and, and this has just been a tragedy all around uh, for those families. And, and when we break this apart a little bit, let me try to provide some context of the situation. Uh, first off, you hear a lot of talk from uh, Netanyahu from the defense minister about rules of engagement, the ROE. Those are basically the guidelines that a military will put out prior to any operation. How we'll fire, how we'll conduct defensive operations. And so that's what they're investigating around. What broke down in the rules of engagement, if you will, for this fighting force. However, and it, I think it's important to understand, Hamas doesn't have uniforms. They wear civilian clothes, and we know that they've been using human shields. So in an urban environment, combat is very difficult, very confusing. And right before this incident, the, the unit that unfortunately killed these hostages was just in a firefight. They were just taking fire from several buildings in the area. So when we look at that, and then you see the confusion come out of men, what we call military age men, in civilian clothes, waving the white flag could have been in that unit. And I'm not trying to excuse that unit's actions or, or really understand the situation on the ground as it was, but waving that could have been a trick because Hamas has done some horrendous things throughout this. So that, that environment, that dynamic environment, that very confusing combat situation led to this tragedy. It's hard to make a snap decision like this when you're in a combat situation. 
Do you think this incident could possibly have any sort of ramifications on the U.S. involvement in the war, the U.S. stance on the war? We know, of course, that the uh, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin will be in Israel, and there are concerns that uh, he may tell them possibly to kind of dial it back uh, due to civilian casualties. Could all of this sort of change any sort of stance by the U.S. and that worldwide support? Well, I, I think when we look at this, and again, it, it's a tragedy. Uh, what first and foremost is going to happen, and it's already happened in Israel, is the, the remaining families of the hostages have definitely started a protest. They held a major protest uh, two nights ago, and then yesterday they protested. And you see Netanyahu talking, trying to talk to those families, especially part of the speech yesterday that he gave. But as we start to work our way forward, I don't know that how much this changes the dynamics. Israel still must accomplish its military objectives. And here, let me strike a balance. We, we've got it, a, the emotional struggle of families with hostages since October 7th. We've got a continued threat from Hamas. And so to strike the balance between that emotional challenge that Netanyahu and, and the Israeli government face, along with having to accomplish their military objectives, is a, is a delicate situation. And so while we think and our hearts go out to, to those families of the hostages, I don't know how much the world support a pro or against Israel is going to change. I mean, it's already been slipping. You see a lot of pro-Palestinian protests throughout there, pro-Hamas protests spreading throughout the region. And so when I look at that, and I hate to say this, I would wonder how many of those protesters are going to come out and express any kind of condolences for the family. As for the United States, I think what Austin's going to do, and I believe the chairman of the Joint Chiefs is traveling with him also, I think what they're going to try to do is reinforce what the U.S. has been saying is, is temper your assault, uh, temper how you're going in there. But when I look at everything, I think Israel is trying to methodically go through and take its military objectives as they have pushed south and push Hamas to some of its strongest defensive areas that they have down there. So I don't know how much is going to change. I do know that there are some back channel negotiations that just started. And so there's perhaps a pause in the future, but any pause that comes out is going to be in Hamas's favor. And I, and I know that sounds a, a little bit cold to say it might be good for a few hostages, but Hamas will gain the upper hand in any kind of military pause at this time. We also learned this weekend that the USS Kearney shot down at least 14 uh, Houthi drones in the Red Sea Saturday and that a Royal Navy warship shot down a suspected attack drone targeting commercial ships there. Why are the Houthis targeting these ships? Do we have that answer? Do we know at this point? Well, like any good intel officer, I would love to tell you I know 100% what's going on, but I'll give you my best assessment as we're looking at this. You know, a week ago when we talked, Josh, there had been 24 attacks that the U.S. had intercepted. We had what we call a barrage attack yesterday, 14 in one day. And that's how many the Kearney shot down. You referenced the, the British vessel that shot one down. There was a French vessel that shot, I believe, two down. And the Egyptians even got into the uh, issue and they shot down a couple. So that was a significant barrage attack. Now, <clears throat> you asked me, do we know why the Houthis are doing this? And, and what I'd really like to step back and say, it, it's not the Houthis per se. They're the tool. They're the instrument. It's really the Iranians. And I've talked about the Iranian support to the Houthis before, but, but the sophistication of this type of barrage attack, the sophistication of the one-way attack UAVs and some of the ballistic missiles that are being used— no way do the Houthis have this capability. So the Iranians have been supplying them. And back when I was, was doing this for a living, we would look at and we would see Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps members on the ground advising the Houthis. I dare say that right now we have IRGC forces on the ground as advisors. And, and with this type of sophistication, I would probably say that they're right there at those launch sites conducting this. So this is this is what Iran is doing in the area. And, and then we look back, I don't know how much of a threat the Houthis really are to Israel, although all it takes is one of these uh, explosive laden UAVs or ballistic missiles to make it through. But we do have 
for, for a nautical term, a picket line set up of our ships, the British ships and the French ships in the Red Sea to help intercept. But what we're looking at is the attack on shipping itself. This is one of the busiest waterways in the earth. 10% of the world's oil goes through here. Almost 20% of the world trade goes through here. We're talking 20,000 vessels a year that transit the Red Sea. So you're, you're looking at a potential destabilizing effect on the economy. This would directly impact, negatively impact the U.S. economy. So when I look at this, this is Iran helping create destabilization throughout that region. And, and just for context, they did this back in the 1980s. They, Iran put mines in the Red Sea up near the Suez Canal back in the 1980s. And then the same thing in the Persian Gulf, they did that in the later 80s. It actually uh, disabled a U.S. warship at that time. And President Reagan at the time conducted a couple of days of strikes. That stopped at that time, uh, at that time. So this is not Iran's first try to destabilize shipping going through there, one of the most important shipping areas. Four of the five world's largest shipping companies have ceased operations going through the Red Sea as of yesterday. And on that same note here, I mentioned U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin is going to be there in Israel, and he did announce here over the weekend that he is ordering warships from the U.S. to stay there in the Red Sea. What is the significance there of, of that move? Well, I, I think that move that sh never should have been announced because I think it should have been something that we expected to see. When we look at why we're there, we're there to ensure the safety of American citizens and American military personnel throughout the region. We're, we're there to send a deterrence message to folks not to get involved. That message should be directed at Iran. And, and the thing with deterrence, Josh, and what we have to realize is you have to have the capability, which we do but you also have to have the will to use that. And your adversary has to know that. At this point, we've shown no deterrence, true deterrence to Iran because they continue to employ the Houthis to conduct these attacks and the militias. We're up to 98 attacks on U.S. forces throughout the region. You know, that keeps climbing as we're looking at those attacks. All we've done is about four or five, what I would call very small, counterattacks against some of those attacks from the, the Shia militia in Iraq and Syria. So right now, Iran has no deterrence to, to stop what they're doing. So those forces need to stay there. And, and if I may, you know, and I'm probably coming out a little bit of my Marine Corps time here, but, but we need to send a message back to Iran. And I am not, absolutely not talking about an all out war, but, but what we can do is, is we can easily, and ease is a relative term in military, but I think over a couple of days we could stop all the Houthi attacks uh, with those UAVs because it, we should know where they are, we should know how they're firing, and we should have warning. If we don't, then our intelligence and our Defense Department folks are not doing their job, but we could easily set a deterrence message without putting many U.S. forces in danger by attacking the Houthis and doing a little bit more uh, specific attacks into the Shia militia in Iraq. So I think we could do that, and I think we need those forces there. We just have to utilize them for the better benefit in the longer term. The Karim Shalom uh, crossing there is going to be reopened by Israel. This will be the first time since we actually saw the war begin there over on October 7th. What is the significance of that move? Because you hear a lot about the Rafah crossing, but what about this other crossing that will be opened up there? Actually, this is good news, Josh. And, and when we look at that, you're, you're right. We all hear about the Rafa crossing, everybody going through there, the hostages being released through there. However, the Karim Shalom crossing, it, basically that is the major crossing for goods to transit through. It's better set up. It's a larger facility to move trucks through there. So I think this is going to be great for humanitarian aid. It's going to be great getting supplies in. Israel wants to open that up. It's going to help everybody. The U.N. has been talking about it. So I think this is a very positive development. However, the one caution is Israel is going to have to ensure they work out some inspection process and protocols to ensure that a lot of supplies aren't making it into Hamas. That's been one of Israel's concern with these crossings. So this is a very positive development I see moving forward. 
and kind of going in reverse a little bit because we touched on the Houthis overall, but we hear a lot about Hamas and think of them as, you know, the main, I guess, opponent there of Israel. But what's important to note is that you have Hezbollah and the Houthis that are also uh, fighting against Israel, correct? Yes, you, you absolutely do. So when, when I look at this and I see Hamas, that's kind of the impetus. That's where everything started out there. But if we spread it out a little bit more regionally, you do have the Houthis down there. They're bringing the fight in there, but that's Iran directed. That's how Iran's trying to keep Israel off balance and the United States off balance and any allies who are supporting Israel. And then you have Hezbollah and they're fighting from the north today. There were some additional attacks uh, from the north Israel striking back. So you're looking at this balance and it it's designed to keep one Israel focused on the Hamas fighting but also off balance as I look at the regional aspects of it. In the U.S., we're, we've got two carrier groups. We've got a Marine amphibious unit that's there. So you start to look at those aspects and you see everything going out there. It's more of a regional context and up, keeping Israel off balance, as I, as I said. All right, Mark Chandler, as always, thank you so much for taking the time to provide your expertise and help break down all these developments. I say it all the time, but they pretty much happen on an hourly basis at this point. Is there anything else you want to add here before I let you go? Josh, there is one thing just to, for Americans to uh, stay aware of the situation. You know, this is very common. Uh, if you see something, say something after 9-11, I think we're kind of very secure in America now, but there was a terror cell that was rolled up, uh, arrested in Germany earlier in the week. Uh, that also included elements in the Netherlands and Denmark. So seven Hamas individuals, Hamas terrorists were rolled up. These individuals had a direct link to Hamas leadership. Now Hamas has called for global attacks on Jews and for attacks on the United States. The fact that this terror cell was was captured in the planning stages of an, of an attack, I think is something that people need to be aware of. And then later in the week, we had uh, an imam in Michigan actually call for a jihad, actually called for Muslims to, to look out and, and say that you need to practice and be prepared for jihad and martyrdom. And that's in the United States. And this, this Muslim cleric, this imam, excuse me, located in Michigan, Jabril, he actually was one of the ISIS primary online recruiters during that conflict. So we have to look at that because inspired attacks can occur. The FBI has talked about an increased threat level here in the United States. So as we're into this busy holiday season, I just think we need to be aware of our surroundings. And, and I don't think it would be justice if I didn't kind of bring that aspect up today. I agree. Thank you for mentioning that as well as we are getting close to the holidays here. I appreciate it. Mark Chandler, thank you as always for taking the time to be here. Uh, we appreciate it. Have a good rest of your day. Josh, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here and you, you have a great rest of your day also. I know it's going to be busy. Oh, yeah. All right. Thanks again.